Hi, ninth graders. So today in chapter nine, we will be talking about the Protestant Reformation and the Council of Trent. We saw the period of the church from eighth to the 14th centuries in the previous lesson. This is generally known as the dark period of the church. After the 14th century marked the beginning of renovation of Europe, the renovation could be considered as the rebirth of the Greco-Roman culture, art, and literature. The Renaissance was a fervent period of European cultural, artistic, political, science, and economic rebirth following the Middle Ages. Generally described as taking place from the 14th century to the 17th century, the Renaissance promoted the rediscovery of classical philosophy, literature, and art. Some of the greatest thinkers, authors, statesmen, scientists, and artists in human history thrived during this era, while global exploration opened up new lands and cultures to European commerce. The Renaissance is credited with bridging the gap between the Middle Ages and modern day civilization. The Renaissance started in Florence, Italy, a place with a rich cultural history where wealthy citizens could afford to support budding artists. Humanism, which extols human being and human intellect, imparted strength to the renovation. Humanism and the Renaissance therefore played a direct role in sparking the Reformation, as well as in many other contemporaneous religious debates and conflicts. Under this circumstance, the Catholic Church through the Council of Trent carried out the activities of renovation. The theme of this lesson is the Protestant Reformation, which took place during 15th and 16th centuries and the Council of Trent. The reasons for the Protestant Reformation or renovation, alias Lutheranism, are many. One of the most important reasons is the spiritual decadence of the church in the Middle Ages. The lack of scholarship and theology of the church, defects of the order of liturgy, and the ignorance of the leaders of the church were all reasons for this. One way that the Renaissance impacted Christianity was that it increased curiosity about early church writings in Greek. In the medieval period, the emphasis was on scholasticism. In the study of scholastic theology, students studied commentaries on the scriptures. Besides the increasing regional conscience, the unbridled ardor of autocrats for authority and the intellectual progress enhanced during the period of renovation. All these gave impetus to the Lutheran renovation. At that time, the Latin Vulgate, a 4th century translation, was the officially recognized Bible of the Catholic Church. Renewed pursuit of knowledge, loosening of traditional hierarchies, growing dissatisfaction with corruption in the Church, and revival of scholarly interest in classical and Christian sources all began during the Renaissance and laid the groundwork for the Reformation. Many had the audacity to oppose the church, sacraments, and the authority due to the influence of philosophy. Since undue importance was given to customs, liturgy deteriorated into mere rituals and became lifeless. The interest to oppose the authority of the Pope and the Italian dominion was strengthened. Even in modern Christian circles, these men are sometimes viewed as troubled individuals wrestling with personal demons, overreacting to the issues of their day and causing rifts within the church that have yet to heal. The name Protestant came into existence with the revolt that took place at Speyer in Germany in the year 1529. There are many factors that led to both the Renaissance and Reformation. Let's talk about those. One, the advent of universities in late medieval Europe brought with it a spirit of inquiry and a thirst for knowledge. 
Theology was still queen of the sciences, but theologians sought to look beyond traditional universal dogmas and explore the particulars of human experience and the natural world. Two, the Black Death of the 14th century decimated Europe, killing between 30 and 60 percent of the population. The wholesale devastation rocked people's faith in the church and the shortage of labor created social mobility, new jobs, and the beginnings of a middle class. Next, the rise of the middle class, in turn, created economic prosperity and a newfound sense of personal freedom for many people. They began to resent the authoritarian control and heavy financial burdens being imposed on them by the medieval church. Four. Earlier reform movements had been sprouting up in various countries over the centuries. Among others is the Englishman John Wycliffe and the set Jan Hus had criticized papal involvement in political and economic affairs and had called for the church to return to the scriptures as its sole rule of faith. Political friction with the papacy came to a head during a period when two and then three rival popes claimed authority over the church. The situation fueled existing resentment among Europe's leaders against a rich, corrupt, and clearly political institution to which they still owed taxes and allegiance. 6. The fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453 sent Eastern Christian scholars fleeing to the West, bringing their Greek manuscripts with them, including the New Testament. This was the key to a revival of classical and biblical studies by returning to the primary sources in their original language. Lastly, the invention of movable type at about the same time by Johannes Gutenberg transformed the spread of knowledge and public learning. For the first time, the Bible as well as other books and documents could be mass produced and placed in the hands of common people at an affordable cost. With this new invention, more people were curious and made inquiries of the teachings from the church were aligned with the scriptures. Now let's talk about Martin Luther. Martin Luther, a 16th century monk and theologian, was one of the most significant figures in Christian history. His beliefs helped birth the Reformation, which would give rise to Protestantism as the third major force with Christendom alongside Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Martin Luther was born at Thuringia, a village in Germany in 1483. Luther began his education at a Latin school in Mansfeld in the spring of 1488. There he received a thorough training in the Latin language and learned by rote the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and the morning and evening prayers. Having graduated from the arts faculty, Luther was eligible to pursue graduate work in one of the three higher disciplines, law, medicine, or theology. In accordance with the wishes of his father, he commenced the study of law. Proudly, he purchased a copy of the Corpus Juris Canonici, Corpus of Canon Law, the collection of ecclesiastical law texts and other important legal textbooks. Less than six weeks later, however, on July 17, 1505, Luther abandoned the study of law and entered the monastery in Erfurt of the Order of the Hermits of St. Augustine. He was ordained priest in 1507. He took his doctorate in theology and was appointed professor of the Holy Scripture in Wittenberg University in 1512. The five years that followed was the important period of the life of Luther. It was on this occasion that he gave shape to his own theology. At the same time, his administrative responsibilities in the Wittenberg Monastery and the Augustinian Order increased, and he began to publish theological writings, such as the Nine Theses entitled 
Disputation Against Scholastic Theology Luther, who had immense anxiety about his own salvation, experienced severe spiritual conflict. The thought about the judgment of God engendered fright in him. He, who thoroughly studied the epistle to the Romans, arrived at this conclusion. God is not a cruel judge. The verse, the one who is righteous will live by faith. That's Romans 1 verse 17 gave him support. But the conclusions he derived from it were wrong. They are, the foundation of salvation is faith only, and Christ has already achieved salvation for us. Hence, man has only to believe and do nothing. Human beings cannot possibly achieve salvation through deeds. Hence, one cannot merit salvation through good deeds and good life. So, he considered that the teaching of the Catholic Church was meaningless and that it was his duty to oppose it. The foundation of salvation or justification is belief alone in God. Human activities cannot merit salvation. He denied the authority of the Pope in order to justify this. Scholars have scrutinized Luther's lecture notes for hints of a developing new theology, but the results have been inconclusive. Nor do the notes give any indication of a deep spiritual struggle, which Luther in later years associated with this period in his life. The foundation of faith is only the Bible, sola scriptura. Any human being may interpret it. There is no need of priest to intercede. There are only two sacraments, baptism and kurbana. Thus, Luther reduced Christian religion to Bible only. Thus, Luther denied those things, which the church had considered holy, namely the sacraments, especially priesthood, tradition, and divine authority. Although the elements that prepare the background for the Lutheran renovation are many, the proximate reason for it was the dispute of indulgence. Even if a sinner gets absolution of his sins through the sacrament of reconciliation, he needs to do penance either in this world or after death in purgatory for the remission of the temporal punishment resulting from sin. When that person fulfills the penance which the church imposes on him with repentance and due preparation, he receives remission from the temporal punishment. This remission which God gives is called indulgence. The church has the authority to grant this indulgence. Through the works of penance, a person receives absolution of sins. Similarly, when we do works of remittance for the souls in purgatory, they also get absolution from sins. Popes Julius II in 1510 and Leo X in 1513 declared that those who contributed towards the construction of the St. Peter's Basilica of Rome would receive indulgence. The religious members of the Dominican congregation were entrusted with the task of preaching this in the Diocese of Germany. In order to attract the faithful towards indulgence, the monks presented the fruits and power of indulgence in an exaggerated manner. Luther, who listened to this preaching, got wild and wrote a letter to Albert, the archbishop of that place in 1517. He prepared a document with 95 resolutions questioning the indulgence, purgatory, penance, and the supremacy of Pope. He affixed this document on the door of the Cathedral of Wittenberg on 31st October 1517. With this, Luther started his open fight. As the influence of Luther grew, the church authorities were ready for conciliatory negotiations with Luther. At the end, Pope Leo X sent the letter to Luther on 15th June 1520, demanding explanation for the 96 resolutions. But instead of giving any reply to the letter, 
he set fire to the letter along with a book of the Code of Canons in front of a large crowd. After this, on January 3rd, 1521, Luther was excommunicated. With this, Luther sharpened his accusations. The followers of Luther increased in number. The German lords undertook leadership of the new religion. The lords and kings used this occasion and siding with Luther, questioned the authority of the Pope of Rome and rebelled against the dominion of Italy. Leaving the religious congregation in 1525, he got married and died on February 18, 1546. The lords and the kings exerted their influence upon those who were under them and led them to accept the ideas of Luther. The Protestants got full freedom in 1556. The obstinacy of Luther with the intention of renovating the church and his pride led to the split of the church and to the establishment of the Protestant or Lutheran church. The Protestant renovation movement started in Germany began to spread also outside Germany. John Calvin in France and Swingley in Switzerland gave leadership to this. By the time the Reformation was over, a number of new Christian churches had emerged and the Roman Catholic Church had come to define its place in the new order. The break with the Roman papacy and the establishment of an independent Church of England came during the reign of Henry VIII in 1509 to 47. The split between the churches of England and Rome was not an event that happened all of a sudden. The unbridled autocratic mentality of Henry VIII of England and his unsteady character affected the relationship with Rome. Henry VIII desired to marry Annibal while his lawful wife Catherine was alive. The king being dissatisfied at this married Annibal publicly. When Pope Clement VII refused to approve the annulment of Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon, the English Parliament, at Henry's insistence, passed a series of acts that separated the English Church from the Roman hierarchy and in 1534 made the English monarch the head of the English Church. The Pope opposed this marriage and he excommunicated Henry VIII for marrying Anne Bull publicly while his lawful wife was alive. Accordingly, it was proclaimed that the King of England would be the supreme authority of the Church of England, thus forming an independent church. Those who do not, did not obey the rules of the King had to undergo cruel persecution. Bishop John Fisher and Thomas More, the Chancellor of the King, were executed. After Henry's death, Protestant reforms of the Church were introduced during the six-year reign of Edward VI. In 1553, however, when Edward's half-sister Mary, a Roman Catholic, succeeded to the tr throne, her repression and persecution of Protestants aroused sympathy for their cause. However, this union would not last with Rome. When Elizabeth I became queen in 1558, the Independent Church of England was re-established and Catholic churches were banned. During this period, many Catholics were imprisoned or killed. She persecuted the Catholics who intended to reinstate relation with Rome. Through her reign for 50 years, the Church of England, or the Anglican Church, God established. The Anglican Church, which, having accepted the thoughts of renovation of Germany and France and having formed a new creed and mode of rule centered on the bishop, officially came into existence. The evangelical movement in the 18th century emphasized the Protestant heritage of the Church, while the Oxford movement in the 19th century emphasized the Roman Catholic heritage. These two attitudes have continued in the church and are sometimes referred to as low church and high church, respectively. Since the 20th century, the church has been active in the ecumenical movement. 
the Church of England has maintained the Episcopal form of government. It is divided into two provinces, Canterbury and York, each headed by an archbishop, with Canterbury taking precedence over York. Provinces are divided into dioceses, each headed by a bishop and made of several parishes. St. John Henry Newman, he was influential churchman and man of letters of the 19th century who led the Oxford movement in the Church of England and later became a cardinal deacon in the Roman Catholic Church. He went into deep study of the church like Armari Venios and eventually found the true faith and converted over to the Catholic Church. The word Newman of India given to Mari Vanyos comes from St. John Henry Newman, who faced obstacles to rejoin the Catholic Church. In the Cedra of the Night Prayer on Kudos Ito, the Church prays for its protection from enemies, discords, and heresies. Lord, regard and grace your Church that you redeemed with your precious blood. Protected from the divisive schemes of its enemies, from disputes and quarrels. Confirm it in your counsels and the observance of your life giving commandments. The crisis and split that occurred in the church in the 16th century were the most painful events in the history of the church. Let us try to work for the church and to think along with the church when crises and problems arise in the church. Now here's your Bible verse to memorize. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14 to 15. All right, ninth graders, well, that's all for Sunday school today. Make sure you review your lesson as well as memorize your Bible verse. Have a wonderful week. God bless. Bye. Well, ninth graders, that's all we have for today. So don't forget, honor your father and mother, respect them, and respect all elders. Treat everyone with love and compassion. Have a blessed week. Bye.